Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wayne's World of Science and Technology. And a little bit of channel admin first. Uh, if you see me dressed casual like this, it means it's just a general video. If you see me wearing a red hat, I think it's super important. If I'm dressed in a suit, that means I'm actually talking about some research I've done myself. And um, so that's basically what you're going to be seeing if you look. Also, I've changed my office as you can see, and I think things work a little bit better. I also should have better sound this time round. I dug out my snowflake mic. So let's start into it. We're going to, today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to ha, tell you about the talk and build a fire rule as applied to paleoanthropology. And most of you are probably sitting there going, what rule? <laughs> um, the talk and build a fire rule was invented by H. Beam Piper, uh, March 23, 1904 to November 6, 1964. Piper was a science fiction writer, and like most science fiction writers, he tried to keep up with the science of the day. And um, one of the biggest issues that science fiction writers were grappling with in the 50s and 60s was what is intelligence? How do you tell an agent alien is actually intelligent? I mean, if they show up in starships, yeah, they're, that's a pretty good indication. It doesn't help you when you have a planet with where no life is building starships. For that matter, you could run into things that look like cities, but they might actually built, be built by um, large insect uh, analogs instead, which wouldn't necessarily be intelligent. Now, uh, Piper wrote about this issue in his classic 1962 novel, Little Fuzzy. Uh, there will be a link to the Wikipedia page for Little Fuzzy below. I'm not including an Amazon link because I really have to admit I'm not sure who actually holds the copyrights to this right now. So if you want to go find the book, and I highly recommend you do, um, I'll leave that to you. Now, um, in Little Fuzzy, the indigenous species made tools, but they didn't use fire and they didn't talk. Um, this throws things off when you you know talking about the talk and build a fire rule. Um, the uh, politicians of Piper's Terran Federation had wanted to avoid the genocides that occurred to uh, the. Uh, natives on earth and uh, so the talk and build a fire rule was instituted to prevent colonists from claiming that hey we didn't know they were intelligent and wiping out the uh, local dominant life form and uh, quite frankly there are people who would do that either because of profit or because well <laughs> they're mean so-and-sos anyway um You can see how this applies to uh, paleoanthropology. Piper's hero, Jack Holloway, meets an alien that doesn't meet the definition of intelligent, legal definition. No, I said that in this case. But, you know, in, at least in Jack's case, he had a living fuzzy to study. Uh, we're dealing with human relatives that are long since extinct. How do you tell if an extinct hominid is intelligent? For that matter, what is human intelligence? Uh, to quote Wikipedia, Human intelligence is the intellectual capability of humans which is marked by the complex cognitive feats and high levels of motivation and self-awareness. Through intelligence, humans possess the cognitive abilities to learn, form concepts, understand, apply logic and reason, including the capacity to recognize patterns, plan, innovate, solve problems, make decisions, retain information, and use language to communicate. Now, that was as of the exact moment I copied the text off of Wikipedia. We know Wikipedia, the text has probably changed by now. It's been five minutes. Um, but this definition is problematic. How do you measure the intelligence of another species? Many animals learn and apply reason. We've all seen those cute videos on YouTube of dogs opening refrigerators in the middle of the night. It takes a fair bit of reasoning to, for a dog to decide that, oh, I can use my paw to pull that fridge door open, or I can use my nose. They have to form, a, uh, an, uh, form an idea of what they want to do, and then they have to plan through how they're going to do it. And they may actually fail half a dozen times uh, before they finally learn how to do it properly, but if they're stubborn enough, they can and will learn. 
The only point that dogs definitively fail on that scale on is their uh, total inability to use language to communicate with us. Oh yeah, they bark, but quite frankly, most dog barks sound the same. And it's the same with cats. And if you hold on a second, I just want to tease one of my other fuzzy research assistants. This is Soot. Um, you probably can't see him very well because, well, he looks like he called through a coal cellar. But he is actually a fairly intelligent little guy. He knows how to, within his limits, communicate with humans. He knows what he can get away with and what he can't. Um, he's learned that he's not supposed to jump into my lap. It's painful. <laughs> and, well, okay, I'll let you down, little guy. Um... Point being that cats are actually a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. How intelligent, I don't know, because I'm not really not sure how to measure it, and I don't think anybody else is either. Anyway, um, as I said, this, it's a lot more complex with dealing with extinct species. We can't directly observe them. We can't see what they're doing. Uh, we don't know if they use language. We can be pretty certain, I think, based on... Uh, our observations of existing tool using species closely related to the primate taxa that the last common ancestor between us and our closest relatives had the capability to use tools. Did they? Hey, we don't know yet. Um, for that matter, we didn't even know that chimpanzees used tools until Jane Goodall observed them, and that was within my lifetime. <laughs> so, this is where it gets really exciting. To me, anyway. I'm crazy. I think the best thing in life is discovery. And, you know, with new techniques, a rising interest in human ancestors worldwide, I mean, you know, the recent findings of Homo floresiensis, Homo luzonensis, Homo naledi, Australopithecus sediba, and, um, you know, the additional finds in Spain, at, uh, the cave at, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Altaperca, and there's just so much amazing stuff and it is making the papers and a lot more people are getting interested now and with this rising interest and well we also have more living scientists than at any time in the past and uh, i would wager that these scientists are in many ways better educated than the scientists of the past we know more about teaching now than we used to and these scientists have better tools. The tools and techniques we've developed recently are just utterly amazing. You know, being able to get DNA from a uh, Neanderthal tooth, compare it to human DNA and say, oh, wow, yeah, we can show that the, you know, there was interbreeding between the two. It just, you know, stuff like that. Te the new techniques have been utterly amazing. And I think that... Currently, we have one of the greatest opportunities possible to expand our knowledge of our um, ancestors and uh, relatives. We also, of course, have the great opportunity to expand our knowledge in other areas. Sorry, one of my um, shibboleths is exoplanets. I love exoplanets, especially the ones that do weird, weird, weird things. Anyway... Um, I'm really hoping that things are going to go well in uh, 2021, that uh, a lot of good science will be done, and uh, here's hoping that the pandemic is over soon, though I have my <clears throat> doubts about that. Anyway, stay safe, stay masked, and keep washing those hands. Have a good evening.